Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Um, I'm going to present uh, my migration of, of Galia, which is a data manipulation library. Uh, and I'm hoping that my experience will help some of you. Uh, in fact, I'd really like to hear from you after the talk uh, about this. So first of all, what is Galia? Uh, just show of hands, who knows it? Ah, better than nothing. <laughs> Uh, so it kind of looks like this, basically. Um, I took an example with a JSON document, but it's not JSON specific. It's not a JSON library, but basically it allows you to transform data somewhat dynamically and, and print it out or write it out uh, in different formats. But the talk isn't about Galia, so th this is just, uh, this is all I'll show from it. If you want to know more about it, there's a GitHub page, uh, which is a little outdated. A better resource would be this uh, article. Um, this one's more in depth, and finally, I gave a talk last year. If you prefer a video, this is probably the best place to go. Otherwise, the first towards data science article is probably. Um, so, what makes Galia interesting in terms of uh, in terms of migration? Uh, first of all, it's a library. I don't have a lot of dependencies, so so that made it maybe a little easier than other libraries. But it's data centric, so I care a lot about types. It, uh, it integrates with Apache Spark, although it's optional. There's a, a standalone runtime as well. It relies on reflection in, in a lot of places, actually. And so I had to delve headfirst in Scala 3's uh, metaprogramming features because uh, a lot of the runtime is gone now. And I'm not an expert at it. Far from it. So there were multiple attempts at migrating. Uh, the first one was two years ago when they announced, uh, I think, 3.00 and I chickened out. But then there was a second attempt in spring of 2023, and I chickened out again, like bad. But then the third attempt, I was kind of successful. And I'll, I'll explain why I said success-ish later. Um, so the first error message I got, and that was two years ago, was this one. That was the scariest one, because uh, I was, did they move it somewhere else? Or, no, but then I realized it was just gone. Um, so if you're familiar with it, for instance, that would, that, would, uh, that would mean if you use type tag or weak type tag anywhere, this is gone. And to a lesser extent, this one was also pretty frustrating. Uh, I'll talk more on that later. <laughs> but the first one, that was, that was the one that really gave me pause. I was like, wow, okay, this is not gonna be trivial. So a little caveat, it's not a full migration. I should have probably called it uh, uh, support, adding support, uh, but it's less, uh, you know, sounds less fun in a, in a talk. So really, I'm still supporting Scala 2.12, so I can't just migrate everything to the Scala 3 syntax. But I've migrated the parts that I think are the hardest. I don't expect what's left to be difficult. It'll probably just be replacing keywords, like yesterday's presentation from the cloud people, uh, where they explained basically replacing implicits with given and so on and so forth. Like that part I'm not too worried about. Um, and me personally, uh, support for ID was pretty buggy uh, when I last tried it. Uh, I mean, I feel bad, I'm sure they're doing a really great job, but I'm gonna just cowardly wait for it to be stable because this, this, this was a little too much uh, to handle. And one other caveat is that I rely still on enumeratum for enums and not Scala 3s. Um, and I will have to rewrite an entire module of macros that separate uh, but it's not essential to the library, and this, this will actually be a lot easier than the macros that I'm going to describe later. So if you're curious, you can look at this. Uh, if you Google this, it should show up right away. So where do you start uh, your migration? Well, me, I started a little last summer, so <laughs> I'm not, I don't remember everything, but I remember thinking, oh, I should document some of this, because maybe I'll write an article or try and present it. So I. I have some like screenshots, I, caught, I kept some error messages, and this is how I was able to put together this presentation. Uh, so the first thing I did actually is that I, I tried to get a picture of, of what I was using. So I used like super high tech <laughs> text file where I literally just listed all the stuff that pertained to Reflect. And this was actually much bigger than this, it was just a, a small part of it, but that really helped me get a bird's eye view of, of what I was, I was dealing with here. Uh, so it took me a while, but once I had that in mind, it was easier for me to look at what I could use as a replacement. And what that was, was the, uh, the quotes, basically, the macro three mechanism. 
And so I started poking around with it to see if it was going to be possible to reproduce the features that I needed. And I, I suspected it was, because there was no reason why it wouldn't. And I was thinking, on top of that, I'll do a lot of this as compile time as opposed to runtime. So I'll probably have a gain of, of performance as well. So I started poking around at it. And this is a screenshot from last summer where I was really getting depressed. <laughs> uh, and that's why I took the screenshot. If you, if you look carefully, I have a foo.scala, bar.scala, baz.scala, and I was about to add cooks.scala. And you know you're in trouble when you're, when you're that deep into, into prototyping. But this actually happened. Uh, at night, I thought of a way to, to, I thought of using off for type tree, which actually solved the problem that I had. Because uh, there's another way to do it that doesn't quite work. So this is the kind of errors that I encountered. Um, some I've labeled good, some I've labeled bad, and some odd, I guess. So the good ones first, the ones I really like. So I'm going to go through it quickly, but they, I think they make you a better programmer. You're more explicit, so you have to get rid of that procedure syntax. You have to put parentheses wherever they should be. Um, I like that. Uh, I thought I was super diligent, but it turns out I wasn't. There was a lot of errors like this, because I, I try usually to add them, but the, the compiler caught those. And this one was also a great message because I over rely on this anonymous classes by laziness. And this forces you to basically create inter um, intermediate classes. And I like that a lot too. It was a lot of work for me to add them, but I was planning on doing it anyway. So it kind of forced me to do it. And this, um, sometimes I'm lazy and I don't add dot apply. And I also think this is bad practice. We should be explicit about what's going on. Because someone who doesn't know Scala very well will look at this and will not understand that there's a, an, a, an apply method that's always there, basically. Um, so those are also kind of all on the same subject. So it's basically telling you to be more explicit about your implicits. And I think it's good. So for instance, on the, at the bottom here, you can see I had to add class tag of k which I really should have done anyway. I was just being lazy, and, and so it forced, me, it forced me to do that. And um, as a side note, as far as the full migration, I'll have to change that to a given. Um, so now, the bad errors. So the first one uh, I want to talk about, of course, is indentation. So who here has dealt with those? Yeah. So there's a lot of them. They all kind of pertain to the same thing. Um, and they're pretty overwhelming. I had a lot of them. And I had this one as well. I don't know if people at the back can see it. But basically, it was complaining about a modifier, which in this case was private. But it was a problem with indentation, which you would never know, because it took me a while to figure out that one. Um, so a little detour is I have a very idiosyncratic way to, to, to write my code. And if you look at my code base, it looks a lot like this. So I'm obsessed with banners, and, and I indent stuff. So for instance, the second method here, process field, is indented so I know that it's only going to be used by the first method or recursively down the, the, the stack. So nothing enforces that. It's just me. I know that when I write it like this, I know what it means. And, and I'm, I'm tyrannical with this. If I have a co-op student, I force them to do that. And then I kidnap their dogs if they don't, because it just makes things easier. But I don't want the compiler to tell me what I should do about this, or if I should do it or not. I just I think it, it should really be up to me. So I'm disciplined to indent things anyway. So here's a concrete example of, of a problem I had. So it was, it was actually a type mismatch error for some strange reason. But this is the code that was causing it. So the fix was to add those. Uh, comments, empty comments. But I cared to keep that little extra space before, uh, the, for the expressions that weren't negated, basically. So I had to find this trick to keep my indentation until, finally, I discovered this thing, which I had read about, but I, I guess I kind of forgot about it uh, when I started the migration. So I actually fixed a fair amount of, of indentation problems before I found it. Uh, and I intend to keep it for as long as I can. I, I hope they don't intend to remove it, because and the problem is newcomers will probably not set this flag, and they'll probably have to deal with all those scary uh, error messages. So I, I don't think it's a good thing. I know it's something that's been debated a lot, but at least that's my take on it. Now, a couple of odd errors. Uh, so this one was a spurious error 
that occurred at some point. I don't know if it was the Scala, uh, uh, the compiler, or if it was SBT, but I cleaned up everything. It didn't fix it. I started, I don't know, I think I started touching the code again, and eventually, oof, it just disappeared. Uh, I wasn't able to reproduce it, and there's nothing I can file. I just, I don't know what happened there. So it only happened once, but I was quite worried when it happened, because I thought I was going to get stuck forever. A fun one as well was this one. It was a type mismatch where found was X and required was X. It was the exact, exact same thing. And it, it had something to do with dependent types. And I think I kept the code that created that error. So I might be able to actually file something if it is a problem. And if it's not, I would be really curious to know what, why that was. Uh, so things that used to work well with Scala 2 and somehow don't work with Scala 3 or work differently. Uh, so in uTest, the testing library, I, I have some asserts and I had to prefix them with pre-def, but only for Scala 3. So something must have changed in uTest in Scala 3 that conflicts with this assert. So it's just kind of a, an odd thing. Um, maybe I'll mention it, I'll put a ticket somewhere. I, I, I'm very curious to know why that happened. And that one was also really interesting because uh, my code was running fine in Scala 2, but with Scala 3, it complained in a particular file where I had a recursive call in an extension method. Uh, it was complaining that the, the method I was calling wasn't available, and he was suggesting this import. So it's actually really good because he gave me the solution. Uh, but I find it odd, I still don't understand why. Uh, I'd be curious to know why that specific case required me to import it. So I'm basically importing the, the, the implicit class here, within the implicit class. And a lot of casting like this where, um, interestingly, it's a bit similar to the type mismatch above here because what I'm casting as instance of is already an instance of WTT string. And I also don't understand why I have to do that. Um, so if anyone has any idea, that would be really interesting. And that tricky problems. So uh, anyone who's dealt with Spark has seen this before. The task not serializable, which is a horrifying error. It can be very difficult to debug. Um, and basically it happened in one of my, my constructs. And what I had to do was put the, the naive method that's at the bottom in the uh, companion object was initially in the case class. And what's interesting is that this is actually good practice. This is what I should have done in the first place. But Scala 2 was fine with it. And I don't know why. It might have been serializing the Spark context, actually. Uh, but it took me a while to figure it out because everything was working well with Scala 2. And most of my other similar constructs were just fine until I realized that this was the main difference. Um, so that one was an interesting uh, problem. But it, it did force me to do something that is better, which is to favor uh, an object. So the WTT I'll introduce in a minute, but this one is a, a big mystery that I still have left. So I have two versions of the same file. So I basically use that mechanism in SBT that allows you to put like a, a suffix dash two or dash three uh, to override the, the, the default. So I have two versions. It's a fairly small file and they differ slightly and I don't understand why. Uh, the two behave differently, that WTT behave differently in this specific case where I have those implicit evidence and I don't understand why yet. Um, I'd be actually really curious to know if, yeah, if anyone actually can figure that one out, I'd be really curious. Um, so the WTT abstraction I just mentioned, uh, basically there's no drop-in replacement uh, in Scala 3 for type tag or weak type tag. Uh, what you have is some, there's something called Izumi Reflect from the Zio, I think, ecosystem. It's interesting, but it's pretty small and it's a different API anyway. So I, I kind of figured that I might as well use the new macros because I was going to need to learn it at some point. And uh, I didn't want to learn a new way of doing the same old thing. So I moved on to macros. And what I basically needed was the ability to instantiate case classes and information that is contained in this construct here in Galia, which basically boils down to this. Uh, for those who can't see at the back, uh, it's not very fancy, it's just a bunch of information for, for a given type that tells me its name and certain properties, whether it's a sequence or not, and it has fields. If, uh, if I'm describing a case class, I need to know the fields, and it's recursive in that the fields types are themselves type node and type leaf, and similarly, type arguments are also of the same type. So pretty much everything I need is, is in this construct, and this is uh, what I was extracting from weak type tag before and now I'm extracting with macros. 
So macros in Scala 3, um, I find them harder to get started with uh, than Scala 2s. And, and the documentation is still a bit confusing. I, I, I can make suggestions, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a bit confusing. And I think it's maybe more confusing if you come from Scala 2 macros. If you start from scratch with Scala 3s, it might actually be easier. But I had bad habits from Scala 2 macros, and I think maybe that made it harder. I haven't found a way to reproduce quasi quotes the way they were before, and I think it's a design choice. It, it may be better, but it was pretty convenient to have quasi quotes. Like you had less guarantee, but things were pretty, uh, like a lot faster to write, in my opinion. At least for prototyping, I think it was useful. Now, I put a question mark because I'm wondering if with Scala Meta, it might not be possible to use them. And I don't know if the person who presented Scala Meta is still here, but I'd be curious to know about that. And you get a lot of quotes.scala. So this is taken from the Dottie uh, library directly. So when you do macros as of now, at least, you're going to have that file open. And you're going to look at it a million times to figure it out. And you're going to dream about it. And you're going to come to love it and then hate it and love it. I know this thing in and out now, uh, which was at least a very good way to learn it. And I would say that macros in, in Scala 3, they feel sturdier, they feel better. It's probably just my being influenced by everyone saying it is, but I have to say that once you've written it, it feels good. Uh, it felt pretty hobbly with the Scala 2 ones. You knew it was experimental, it was, I don't know. And the same compilation unit, so you can use your macros in the same compilation unit, and that's so much easier than, than Scala 2s. Okay, so I created basically, to get my type information, I created this WTT construct. Um, so it used to be an alias for weak type tag in Scala 2, uh, but now it's basically, it's got its own life in Scala 3 and it doesn't stand for anything else, it's just WTT. And it basically contained a type node, which is that construct I showed earlier, a class tag, that's because of Spark, and the ability to instantiate the, the class. If it's a case class, I'll need to be able to instantiate it, and if it's not a case class, it's none. And basically, it's uh, constructed like this. I make a call to a macro called triplet macro, which is a lot of fun to look at if you're curious. Um, and yeah, that's, so that's the part that took me the, the, the most time. I would say it was like two thirds of the entire migration was just doing that. So what lessons did I learn from this? Um, first of all, I think it would be really ambitious to start from anything else than 2.13. If your code base is still largely 2.12, just, just migrate to 2.13 first. Like it, it would be, because it's not that trivial to migrate to 2.13 already, so doing both at the same time would be uh, ambitious. If you can refactor your code first, that's gonna help a lot. So I refactored Galia Reflect first, because this is where most of my um, meta programming was gonna be. So it allowed me to take that big chunk out do everything Scala 3 related there, and then the part for Gallia Core was a lot easier to, to, to change. And I would use the no and then flag, at least at first, so you can get rid of all this. Uh, it still shows up as warnings um, under a slightly different form, actually, so I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but it's, it's a lot easier to at least start with it. And then if you really, if you really want to then, uh, use that in, this, in a significant indentation, then you can remove it later. And there are two options from the Scala 3 compiler, rewrite and xsource3. Uh, I've only played with them once, because uh, I was curious. So it, it'll actually do a lot of the rewriting for you. But me, the code base isn't so big that I, I could do it manually. So I, I wanted to do it manually just to learn and understand better. But if you have a huge code base, like the people who presented yesterday, I feel like you probably don't have a choice. And this is probably extremely useful. And yeah, of course, address the simple errors first, because just adding parentheses, explicit types, and so on, it gets rid of a lot of those, those errors very quickly. And if you have the no and then flag on, then you'll really just be left with the hard ones, and you can probably tackle those uh, first, because that, that's where the uncertainty really lies. And yeah, if you still have to maintain 2.x like I do, uh, that SBT construct of having the dash 2.3 in the folder convention, that, that's amazing. That's really great. Like, use it a lot at first and then change it later, uh, but it'll save you a lot of time. So if you want to try Galia with Scala 3, I just published the binaries last week. Uh, so I realized I should have shown an example of uh, Scala CLI, but that's just SBT. So you set your Scala version to 331, 
you add the dependency on Gallia Core 0 0.6.1, throw that in a build, open SBT console, you import Gallia that's star, so that's how you know you're a cool kid and you're using Scala 3, not Scala 2. Uh, and then you can just create some dummy object and just transform it, print it out, and it should work. Uh, all my tests pass, uh, and most of the, the applications that I've written with it seem to succeed so far, but I'm sure there's still some bugs. Um, so, in conclusion, I would say it's mostly a positive experience for me. Uh, I don't know if everyone's going to have as good an experience as I did, but I really thought it was going to be a lot harder. Because um, I... Once I decided to tackle the migration, and once I realized that the, that runtime was gone from Reflect, I knew that that was going to be the hard part. So once I tackled it, it was actually really not that bad. Uh, so yeah, kudos to the Scala team, because I don't think it was that easy. So for a new major version, I'd say it's as successful as it can be, minus the significant indentation. Uh, but yeah, the Scala 2.3 folder convention is amazing. And the 2.13 and 3x interoperability was really a great idea. Um, that, I think, is going to make things a lot easier for a lot of people. It probably came with a lot of trade-offs, but I think it was worth it. So migrating your code base may, I don't know, it, your mileage may vary. It'll depend on whether you have a lot of dependencies, if you, if you rely on run type or, uh, run time or not. Like, but I know that there are some projects like mine that were actually not so bad, and, and I'm really glad I did it. Because, um, yeah, I was, after the second failed attempt, I wasn't sure I was going to try anytime soon. But uh, it's actually people at Scala Days that motivated me to do it. I felt like everyone was pretty eager to use it. So I was like, all right, let's just do it. Uh, yeah, so if you have a lot of dependencies, it might be difficult. Um, just a quick note on future direction. The first thing that I'm going to do is add support for Scala 3 enums and enumeratum. I'll have to finish porting that uh, macro uh, module. Uh, I will drop support for 2.12, probably when uh, EMR uh, actually provides 2.13 uh, instead of 2.12. I'm probably going to generalize my WTT abstraction because I think it could be useful to, to someone else. And the last more exciting thing for me is the optimization, because that's one of the big problems with Gallia, is that it's, it's very slow. Um, and in a nutshell, basically it stands for on steroid with overhead. Uh, if you, you want to look at it, it's, uh, it's in the documentation here. And basically, uh, I'm going to optimize my, my data DAG. I'm going to generate the source code for the case classes and transformations. And I'm a runtime compile it, which comes with an overhead. And then I'm going to run it. But on big data, you're typically going to be running it on Spark anyway, so you're going to have that overhead. And you have the option to not use this mechanism if you just want to run things locally and, and performance isn't as critical. So that I'm pretty excited about. Um, yeah, and you can look at the prototype here. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I'm very jet lagged. <laughs> be gentle. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, a colleague of mine is worried that uh, people would be puzzled, will abandon Scala, uh, w working with Scala and Spark because of Scala 3. Do you have any insight or opinion about that? I was also worried last year before I attended Scala Days because I had underestimated how much adoption it had. Um, I think a lot of people are eager to adopt it, they're just a little worried about it. Um, but it might be interesting to have a, a horror story to hear about someone who tried and miserably failed. I mean, be sorry for them, but that might make, you know, give us a clearer picture. So far, most migrations I've heard about were not trivial, but people were able to do it. So I'm less worried about it now, but yeah, I, I was very worried myself. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a thing about um, the fear that you, you, you said. People are not really afraid of Scala 3. I think they're hostages of Amazon. <laughs> Thank you for calling them out on this. <laughs> I know Galia uses uh, a lot of metaprogramming uh, facilities uh, to statically check many things. Uh, I think you... You check at compile time uh, 
consistency between uh, columns and rows manipulation. Uh, I would like to know if uh, inline and uh, scala three macros made the uh, the code uh, more elegant on the migration done. Yes, I, I think I think the result is more elegant. Uh, with that said, because I'm not very good at that part, it's probably suboptimal. Uh, I'm sure there's much better ways to do it than I did. So I think once I really get a good grasp on, on how to do proper metaprogramming in Scala 3, I think, yeah, it'll, it'll be a lot nicer. And it'll probably be faster as well. I haven't had time to do any benchmarking, but I'm pretty confident it will be. OK, thank you. All right, thanks a lot.